Hi, I'm Ryan Baker, and this is Big Data in Education. And today we're going to continue our discussion of classifiers with neural networks. So you may remember classification. There's something you want to predict, the label. The thing you want to predict is categorical. It's one of a set of categories, not a number. So neural networks. Neural networks compose extremely complex relationships through combining what are called perceptrons. They find very complicated models. Perceptrons have evolved a lot over the years, but let's start with the classic perceptron. <clears throat> a perceptron takes a set of inputs. It has a weight for each input. It multiplies those weights by the inputs. It adds it all together. It adds an intercept, and then it applies a step function. Remember step regression from earlier in this week? It applies a step function to get 0 or 1. And the step function is basically that if the entire function is greater than a certain value, in this case 0, you output a 1, and otherwise you output a 0. So for example, we have inputs m, n, and p with w weights 1 for m, 0 for n, and negative 0.5 for p, and a b intercept of 0.1. So then we can take any set of values of m, n, and p, let's say 1, 7, and 2, and we can calculate f of x. So f of x in this case would be 1 times 1, that's 1, 7 times 0, that's 0, and 2 times negative 0.5, which is negative 1, giving a sum of 0, but then we got that intercept of 0.1, so we get 0.1, and uh, at the end of that, it's going to say, oh, it's greater than 0, and it's going to output a 1. And another example for your uh, practice at home, what if m, n, and p were 1, 0.003, and 8? Now that's a classic perceptron, but actually, usually modern neural networks use more complex decision functions than just a step function. They might use a logistic function. They might use a 10h function. They might use a ReLU function. Uh, ReLU is that if x is greater than 0, x, and if x is less than or equal to 0, 0. And they use many more. Now that's one perceptron. And one perceptron can have multiple inputs. But notice I didn't say single perceptron model. I said neural network. Neural networks take a lot of inputs, and they can produce multiple outputs, which is kind of awesome. Um, in this diagram, the red circles are predictors. And those predictors point in a complex, super complex fashion, really um, an all-to-all -all fashion, but you can have weights of zero that make it no longer all-to-all, -all. they point to perceptrons, and those are the blue circles. And those perceptrons point out to predicted variables, and you can have more than one predicted variable. And what you see here is a single layer neural network. It's just got a single layer of perceptrons, and it's a very, very, very simple one, because Generally, there are hundreds or thousands or millions or more of hidden perceptrons. And again, this is just a simple single layer neural network. And in a single layer network, you have one set of perceptrons in between your inputs and your outputs. Um, and that could be a million perceptrons in between those, those inputs and outputs, but it's still only a single layer of them. But then we can move on to deep learning. And in deep learning, we have multiple layers of perceptrons that feed into each other. So the inputs feed into the first layer of perceptrons, which feed into the second layer of perceptrons, which feed into the third layer of perceptrons, and so on and so forth, until we finally output the predictions. And we call these hidden layers because we never actually see them directly. We see the inputs, we see the outputs. Only the data scientist knows how many hidden layers are in the middle. So we call this idea of having multiple layers deep learning. And sometimes it works really great. And the reason why it's thought to work so well is because it can capture multiple layers of abstraction without having to do so in a way that human beings can understand. So if you think about the multiple different levels, say, of language, where um, you've got phonemes that, that are embedded in words, and you've got words that are embedded in phrases, and you've got phrases embedded in sentences, and sentences that embed in paragraphs. In that case, we have multiple layers and we know what they mean. But deep learning doesn't have to have interpretable multiple layers. And you're probably saying, well, this is kind of complex, but don't worry. There's lots of ways to make things more complex still. Because often the term deep learning isn't actually reserved for just multiple hidden layers. It's reserved for recurrent neural networks or more complex algorithms still. 
and recurrent neural networks fit on sequences of events. They keep some degree of memory, quote-unquote, about previous events. And this is a different category of prediction models than classifiers that treat events as separate. Now, I used the term deep learning a minute ago, but actually the term deep learning is usually reserved for recurrent neural networks, or more complex algorithms even still. And recurrent neural networks fit on a sequence of events. They keep some degree of memory about the previous events, um, but what they're doing is, rather than having a single event, a single prediction being made, you have a sequence of events, a sequence of occurrences, and you want to make predictions about each event in that sequence. And so a recurrent neural network says, okay, I still remember what prediction I made for Ryan at time four, now I'm making a prediction at time five, and I'm going to use that information from time four and before. And this is actually a different category of prediction model than classifiers that treat these events as separate. So recurrent neural networks feed back information from later layers back to the earlier layers. We had that multi-layer neural network, and we're not just going to always go forward, we're also going to go back. A node can, in this way, over time influence itself. So information goes from 1 to 2 to 3, back to 1, say, and it's going to make it back to that node at level 3, and back again. And this allows for a sequence of outputs, because every time you run the whole process forward, you get another set of outputs coming out at the end it gets more complex. Long short-term memory networks are a variant of RNNs that replace perceptrons with what are called LSTM units. And LSTM units have what's called a long-term memory because they reduce information propagation over time for a given piece of information, but they still keep it. But they have a short-term memory in as much as the activation patterns in the network, um, the values coming out of each perceptron, change once per time step. I'm not going to go into full details on this because really getting into the math of this requires linear algebra, and this course does not require linear algebra, but it gets complex, as you can imagine. An LSTM unit, so much more complicated than just a regular perceptron, um, it's got a hidden state in it, it's got an input gate, it's got a forgetting gate, it's got an output gate. Just take a minute to look at all the stuff that's happening here, right? And this is actually showing a sequence of LSTM units. The blue left, middle, right, are different LSTM units with different inputs and outputs, and at each one of those steps there's this complex model involving um, hidden states and forgetting going on. And deep learning has led in turn to what are called sometimes transform models or foundation models. Um, an example of this include BERT, MathPERT, the GPT family, ChatGPT, DALI, Stable Diffusion. You've no doubt heard of some of these. Um, these are the ones as of when I'm writing this slide. Who knows what there will be by the time you're watching this? And transform models can predict all kinds of things. Words, sentences, pixels, computer program text, uh, GitHub Copilot, mathematical equations. We don't know all the things that they can predict yet, but they're super powerful. And what's really fascinating about these things is that in a sudden light switch transformation, prediction becomes generation. Because when you can predict things that are sufficiently complicated, you can use that process of prediction to become a process of just generating it from scratch. These are created using neural networks trained on enormous data sets. They enable impressive performance for new problems with minimal or even no training data for the specific problem, just by using the sheer volume of previous things that have been seen by the algorithm. This is also called zero-shot learning. And we're going to discuss transformer slash foundation models in detail in week seven. They only work for a subset of problems, but where they work, it's, it's just amazing. It's magic. In our next lecture, we'll conclude our week on uh, prediction models, our first week on prediction models, with explainable AI. Thank you very much.